If we take a cross section of those outer shelf sediments, we can actually see the mega scale lineations in cross profile. We can see a strong reflector beneath them, which represents over consolidated glacial material. And if then we look at the properties of that material, we can see just a very thin, less than 50 centimeters thick post glacial and deglacial sequence. But the bulk of the sediments below, above that very strong reflector, is effectively subglacial deformation till, and that is the material that allows the ice to flow fast. And for the first time, we can specify the low shear strength of that material, and we can also map out over, in this case, an area of about 6,000 square kilometers, the extent and the thickness of that subglacial deformation till. And it ranges indeed from about four or five up to about 15 meters in thickness. Not necessarily that all of it is deforming at once. The planes within it are probably the sources of deformation. But it is the rheology of that, that deformation till that allows fast glacier flow to take place. Thirdly then, can we make inferences about the nature and rate of ice sheet retreat looking at these landforms? You've just seen the features from Marguerite Bay. The observation then is very well preserved streamlined subglacial bed forms. The interpretation of that is they are well preserved um, because the ice has lifted off rapidly at the beginning of deglaciation and ice retreat through the outermost shelf is therefore also rapid. So where we see these very well preserved landforms, we're saying lift off and retreat of the ice is very rapid during deglaciation. A second observation, where we see sedimentary wedges, grounding zone wedges, separating streamlined bed forms, retreat is episodic. It's probably fast between various pinning points, which are shown by the sedimentary wedges there. And this, again, is a very nice example from Vestfjorden. And the fjord here is about 50 kilometers across. Thirdly, we see in many areas of the Arctic, sets of small transverse ridges. These ridges are one to 200 meters apart and just a few meters in height. They often occur in clusters of tens or even hundreds, backstepping one after the other. This, in turn, represents the slow retreat of a grounded ice margin, and this example is from Belsund in Spitsbergen. So, to summarize, we've got three different kinds of landform, megascale glacial lineations, sedimentary wedges, and small retreat moraines. These represent three very different modes of ice sheet retreat. Rapid retreat on the one hand. Secondly, episodic retreat with superimposed grounding zone wedges. And thirdly, the slow retreat of superimposed moraine ridges. And indeed, sometimes these ridges represent annual or semi-annual um, changes in the ice front. And so on occasions, one can actually count back these ridges one by one, year on year. And you can do that in some of the fjords of Spitsbergen, for example, and indeed one of the big troughs on the edge of Antarctica. So we model this retreat from submarine landforms, unmodified ice stream bed forms, rapid liftoff and retreat, grounding zone wedges, still stands during retreat, sets of transverse ridges, a grounded ice margin that retreats only slowly. And again, this allows us around large areas of both the Arctic shelves and the Antarctic shelves to say, what is the nature of ice retreat? Is it one of those three things? And the challenge then for numerical modeling is can numerical models of full glacial, deglaciation de from full glacial, can they actually reconstruct rapid lift off and retreat in some areas, and on the other hand, slow retreat of a grounded ice margin at others. That is a robust challenge for ice sheet models. Finally, I'd like to show you a more detailed example of the acquisition and interpretation of submarine glacial landforms, our view from the sea, as it were. In this beautiful image which I worked on with Dag Ottison of the Norwegian Geological Survey, we have an assemblage of landforms for surge type glaciers from the prominent red, red i.e. shallow moraine to the present ice front is round about 10 kilometers and within this beautiful swath bathymetric image we've got a set of five superimposed submarine landforms. I'll take you through each of those. 
The first and the oldest are buried, su buried submarine ridges. They're the blue areas there. These ridges are the product of a previous advance of this particular glacier, which is called Borobrayan. Superimposed upon those, and you can actually see the cross-cutting relationships very nicely in this image, is a series of streamlined subglacial bed forms, which was associated with the advance, probably a surge type advance, of this glacier round about 100 years ago. And the cross-cutting relationships are very important in producing a relative age for each of these deposits. So those are the first two. Next, at the terminal moraine, <coughs> we see um, a ridge which, in, because of the black in the image, that implies that the ship, that the, the moraine was so shallow that the ship could not actually get across the ridge. That terminal moraine ridge marks the outermost reach of the surge itself. <coughs> Beyond the ridge, on its ice distal face, you can see a series of very well-defined uh, sedimentary debris lobes. That results from failure of soft sediments on the distal steeper slope of the ridge and those debris flows go down into deeper water, presumably depositing debrites, that is to say sandy pebbly muds um, of a heterogeneous grain size. Inside the ridge, closer to the glacier, uh, we see a set of rhombohedral crevasseful ridges. Those are produced at the end of the glacier surge where water is ejected from the base of the glacier and that water which under high pressure had allowed the ice to flow fast is no longer there so the ice sits down on a soft bed and the sediments are therefore squeezed up into basal crevasses and that's the pattern we see just distal of the prominent moraine ridge and then as the ice continues to retreat now close to the present glacier we see small annual retreat moraine ridges. Those, in fact, in this case, are annual ridges. We can show that by comparison with the former positions of the ice mass uh, from aerial photographs. And again, you can see their dimensions. They're just a very few meters high and spaced, in some cases here, a few tens of meters apart. Now, the question is, first, is that an unusual setting of Borobukta? and can we draw any more general conclusions from it? So, we look at data from other areas at first in Spitsbergen, and this is from Yuldia Bukta, also in Isfjorden in Svalbard. And here we see exactly the same set of features. We have the buried ridges, the streamlined subglacial landforms, the big ridge, rhombohedral crevasses, and the annual retreat moraines. So, we can now generalize from these data sets and say there is a viable land system model for tidewater glaciers of surge type. And you can see it here. I think we've done some additional research over the last couple of years which has shown that sometimes eskers are a part of the system. But otherwise, this is a, a really useful model which we've tested at, at applied to several glaciers in Svalbard and this can be applied more widely now to the geological record in order to identify surge type glaciers, surge type tidewater glaciers in the record. So to conclude, we can use these examples of marine geology and geophysics to provide insights into the form and flow of past ice masses at several spatial scales. Firstly, um, at the scale of whole ice sheets, and we looked in the, the example of the two and a half thousand kilometer Norwegian margin with flow lines of hundreds to thousands of kilometers and large, large marine termini. Secondly, we can look within ice sheets at the presence or otherwise of ice streams and the occurrence of inter ice stream areas on scales of hundreds of kilometers. And finally, we can look at surge type glaciers at scales of up to 10 kilometers or so, where we can see in very fine detail um, sets of superimposed landforms which tell us a lot about the surge process and also about how we can identify the key landforms that we can use to identify surge type glaciers in the marine record. I couldn't resist uh, um, putting up this image, uh, a swath bathymetric image of about uh, 10 kilometer width of the sea floor uh, west of Nordauslandet, west of the Osfurner ice cap 
in Nordaustlandet and eastern Svalbard. I couldn't resist it for several reasons. Firstly, Ostferna was the area where I did my uh, doctoral studies. My PhD was actually on the glaciology of uh, the Nordaustlandet ice caps uh, you know, some, several decades ago now. So there's a strong link there. But also, it's in a way, it's a very beautiful image. And it's, I, I think, science into art. This is the loop is the loop made by a, an iceberg which is ploughing the seafloor sediments. Um, okay, so it's science into art, but it's also art into science because as you see um, from the diagram that I've just put up, uh, we have actually modelled the drift of an iceberg in and out or on a continental shelf with the tide. And if you look at the shape of the ellipse and the size of the ellipse, the modelled and the observed are almost identical. So it's art into science and science into art. Finally, I'd like to conclude by thanking once again the President, Secretary, Council members, and members, you, all of you, of the Arctic science community who've done so much to support and encourage me over the long years. Thank you very much indeed.